four adaptations of Children of the Corn. The first is a short film from 1983 that took advantage of an interesting deal from Stephen King himself. The second film is the most famous adaptation, which also spawned an unexpectedly long-running franchise. The third is a TV movie that sought to stick closer to the source material than the previous entries. And the fourth film is more reboot than remake, focusing on the events preceding King's original story. But which is the best? For decades, Stephen King's work has been prime material for students and other aspiring amateur filmmakers trying to make a name for themselves. The author himself openly encourages these projects. The first collection of the author's short stories, Night Shift, was published in 1978, and so, for the first time, King's shorts were widely available and accessible, catching the attention of hungry up-and-comers. Therefore, King introduced the dollar deal, a way of paying it forward now that he was sufficiently successful. The dollar deal allowed students permission to adapt one of King's short stories for the high price of one dollar. So long as King retained the film rights, and that he should receive a copy of the finished product. His accountants were less than thrilled, but creativity thrived. The most notable youngling to take advantage of this offer was Frank Darabont, who adapted The Woman in the Room, before going on to direct some of the most high-profile King adaptations out there to this day. Among the stories bundled into the Night Shift anthology was Children of the Corn. In a brisk 10,000 words, King managed to create an overwhelming sense of dread, and gave a snapshot of a community gone horribly, horribly wrong. It was only a matter of time before a filmmaker would utilise the dollar deal in conjunction with the haunting tale. John Woodward had no previous credits to his name, but he stepped up as writer, director, editor, and even performed as one of the film's key villains. Attaching his own spin on the original tale, and amending the title accordingly, in 1983, Woodward created the 20-minute short film Disciples of the Crow. The story setting of Gatlin, Nebraska, is shifted to Jonah, Oklahoma. Yep, you know what that means. The children of the corn are now the Oklahoma kids. That's me, I'm the Oklahoma kid. The change in setting is really in name only, as the long dusty roads walled in by two rows of corn remain, as does the eerily quiet town. However, this film does craft a brand new opening that was not included in King's story. Within the creeping corn, a sinister figure is fashioned by a small child. Molly, 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 Molly. We then transport to a church sermon, filled with both children and adults alike. It's here that we understand we are watching a prequel of sorts. The children, disgusted by the looming Jesus and their parents' aggressive handholding, give each other significant nods. That evening, one by one, the children slaughter the adults. We don't see any of the violence, because, if you can believe it, it's happening again! Bird transition! Five minutes in, we're at the point where King's writing began, with a bickering couple driving down the endless, monotonous road, perfectly symbolising their failing marriage. Where are we anyway? Oklahoma. I know we're in Oklahoma, Bert, but where are we? Well, you've got the map, why don't you look it up? Another great representation of their shitty relationship would be driving full speed into a child. Whoop! Look out! What a tragedy. But the husband, Bert, shakes off the horrendous responsibility instantly with some keen observations. Yes, I may have run him over, but I didn't stick this into him. Subtle. He puts the body in the boot and heads on into the nearby town of Jonah. Now this is one spooky place. The town is completely silent and deserted, except for a dog with a unique bark. Vicky, the wife, is feeling the goosebumps. You know there's something wrong here! 
Yeah, be careful. The problem's just over your shoulder. I am not a crow. As a coping mechanism, or a way of getting back at Bert, Vicky starts rubbing the crow ornament in her mouth. What the fuck are you doing? Bert is more weirded out by this than he is by the town of Jonah, so he buggers off to investigate. He owes me what you call a life debt. Your gods demand that his life belongs to me now. Separated, the killer kids launch their strike in the name of a crow god. A special shout out to Mr. Assassin's Creed Jerusalem over here. Ooh. The couple beat them off and drive away to safety, their marriage repaired by a new shared hatred of children. I hate kids. Well, they drive off into ambiguous safety, I guess. The end. Yes, I know what you're thinking now. Where the hell is the ending of the short story? With Bert pursued on foot through the corn, and the terrifying discoveries he makes there. Not to mention, he who walks behind the rose. Ooh. That section of the story basically makes the original text work for me in the first place. So it's a shame that it's all abolished here. This is only a minuscule production after all. Perhaps the written climax would have been too much for their budget, skill, and schedule. In context, I can accept this change. I also appreciate the attempt for their relationship to be rekindled, even if it doesn't really feel earned. Speaking negatively, the changes from the corn worshipping to crow worshipping doesn't affect the plot, but it does diminish the mystical power of the cornrow setting. As it is only a mere 18 minutes long, it also feels a touch rushed. But the biggest crime this short film commits is adding the 5 minute prequel. If a viewer was unfamiliar with the original story, all mystery and intrigue is butchered right there and then. By the time Bert and Vicky arrive on the scene, you already know and understand the threat that awaits them. The intro should have been cut and replaced with more time building up the uncanny dread, especially at the roadside incident. Again, I must stress this is a very low budget affair from the early 80s, produced by a seemingly first time filmmaker. With that in mind, there's enough here to commend John Woodward. His resume shows only two further credits, a tale of an erotic dancer called Good Girl, Bad Girl, and a tale of an erotic dancer called Vice. Now I feel like I have to rewatch the short film, keeping an eye out for the erotic dancing crow. So, Disciples of the Crow is a fine attempt, but it fails to properly capture the strengths of the source material. Namely, the dreaded puzzle the couple have to solve, and the gruesome consequences of the story's end. These days, the short is only worth a watch for curious fans of the short story, wanting to see a different take on the tale. Ooh, god dang, look at that. The aggressively raised sickle in spooky silhouette against the deepest red, this side of Argento. Add an appropriate row of corn and slap the king's name on there and you've got yourself an iconic poster. It's just a shame that including that name on the marketing would prove to be so costly. The author had recently taken his first stab at screenwriting in 1982 with Creepshow. For a debut transition from writing for the page to writing for the screen, he did a pretty swell job. So, during another snow day, he wrote the original draft for the upcoming Hollywood adaptation of Children of the Corn. However, his work was not so well regarded on this occasion. Unsurprisingly, King's draft kept close to his original short story. The first act consisted entirely of Bert and Vicky tearing each other a new cornhole. After a so-called unconventional narrative structure, the film would end with the novel's very grim finale. Vicky would be captured and tortured on a corny crucifix, even having her eyes removed. Bert's death would soon follow, slaughtered by he who walks behind the rose. The children would then be punished by the disappointed monster, with their age of mortal retirement demoted from 19 to 18. Pretty much a massive downer for everyone involved. The studio executives were in the market for something a little more sellable. I'm out. George Goldsmith was hired to perform an extensive rewrite, despite King's reservations. The pair became a regular Bert and Vicky. King accused Goldsmith of not understanding the horror genre. Goldsmith retaliated, accusing King of not knowing the difference between a novel and a script. 
You could cut the tension with a cob. But in the end, it was Goldsmith's screenplay that was given the green light. Pre-production went swimmingly, and with a proposed budget of $1.3 million, all were eager to create the next hit King film. Ho 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 But in the words of my good friend Omar, You come at the king, you best not miss. The author suddenly dropped a big old ultimatum in their laps. Either you pay me an additional $500,000, or you're not featuring my name in the marketing. Caught between a rock and a hard maze, the producers succumbed to his demands. The budget was now a mere $800,000. Still a huge step up from the 1983 short film, but not nearly enough to cover all of the ideas in the ambitious script. Before shooting, and during shooting, many details were amended, for the worse, or removed completely, with entire scenes being scrapped. What remains is the finished film. So. Shall we have a gander? Count us in, Linda. A one, a two, a one, two, three, four, no more Well, what do you know? The feature film begins much the same as the short film. Before the credits, a prequel section once again reveals the murderous turning point for the town of Gatlin. The children embark on another violent nodding spree, which soon evolves into a violent killing spree. Yes, yes, this revolt is distinctly more ferocious. Those kids in the short version were wimps, waiting until mummy and daddy were settled in bed. These little shits want to make a point. Enjoy your last trip to the crummy country diner, you fully matured fucks. Poisoned coffee, butter knife slices, shoving a dude's hand into a bread splicer, turning this poor kid's ice cream into a Sunday bloody Sunday. Again, it does tarnish the later mystery. The audience knows what awaits Bert and Vicky, as opposed to us enjoying the mystery along with them. But even I have to admit, this prologue does set up the villains as a true force to be reckoned with, despite their childly statures. The credits then roll, with a dime a dozen creepy child crayon montage, but the choir is a nice touch, given the religious thematics. Okay, let's finally catch up with our protagonists. In the first obvious instance of Goldsmith running King's draft through the shredder, Bert and Vicky are not bickering. On the contrary, they appear to be on very good terms indeed. It's Bert's birthday, also known as a Bert's Day. Lucky him, he receives the gift topping everybody's wish list. A slightly steamy dance from Linda Hamilton. <laughs> the performance sadly comes to an end, and we return to familiar territory. Bert and Vicky's wacky road trip. Hey man! <laughs> they broom broom down the empty Nebraska back roads, and a little tension does simmer between the couple. Yet, this version of their relationship is still easier on the stomach for sure. They have their issues, but it's nothing overwhelming, and they're definitely not on their final straw. Since we're not worried that their marriage is about to crumble, the film moves us back to some of the kids in Gatlin. Seeing as the mystery was already removed, Goldsmith at least developed a small element from King's story. That is, not all the children blindly follow this new religion. Now, we get a little time to explore this, but not for too long. Young Joseph attempts to flee, but is chased through the corn by that damned choir. His throat is slit, ruining a perfectly good suitcase. You know the drill by now. A couple, in a moment of distraction, accidentally put the poor boy out of his misery. Right, look out! Just like the short, this adaptation also can't resist the urge to do the whole Voorhees in the bush trope. At least they've worked on their lung capacity since last time. Quitters Inc works, kids. This version of Bert is no stranger to medical matters. Bragging with his knowledge of blood coagulation. Blood starts to coagulate in four minutes. He confirms the kid was pretty much dead already. He bravely investigates hinting towards the action hero style that he'll adopt later. Meanwhile, during this potential manslaughter case, and very real possibility that a throat slitter is still nearby, Vicky decides this is a good time for a kip. Effective nightmare jump scare, go! It's fine, she's no stranger to bad dreams. They shove the body in the tunk. 
must mean trunk. And head on to find help. All they find is an unhelpful mechanic. No gas. I ain't got no gas. No diesel. I ain't got no diesel fuel neither. No phone. Telephone, I ain't got no telephone. No bother. Piss off. His standoffishness nature is soon explained, as he is spooked by the immense force of this corn god. Hey, if all it takes to prove you're a god is making clouds go at two times speed, then get on your fucking knees and watch this. A lengthy scene of suspense shows Mr. Mechanic losing his cool with these little brats. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Ooh, we must be building to something real good. Oh, here we go. Uh, anticlimactic as hell, but at least reasons have been provided. This is one such victim of the budget cuts. First, the old man was supposed to find the decapitated head of his good boy Sarge, but instead just finds a bloody rag. Later, our lost heroes were supposed to return here and find the graphic corpse of the man, his remains perverted by corn idols. The kill moment would still be lacking, but it would be a lot better than nothing. The couple do get lost though, a nice precursor to King's son writing in the tall grass, swapping out corn for tall grass. They give up and enter Gatlin, despite the old man's warning. The plot then follows the typical beats of the original story for a while. The couple navigate the strangely silent town and learn what happened. What's with all this corn everywhere? Who made this mess? Ah, uh, well, that's what you get for hiring a bloody cricket as set decorator. They are attacked. This results in Vicky getting captured, as it was written. But this is where Goldsmith's divergences really crop up again. Bert reactivates hero mode and spends the third act trying to save Vicky from her amazing captivity. He survives an Evil Dead style floral molestation, as well as an encounter with the Tremors. Cool imagery, but in reality, it's an upside down wheelbarrow being hoisted along. Rescuing Vicky is not enough for this manly man. This absolute mensch won't be satisfied until the whole damn farm goes up in smoke. Popcorn, anyone? It's disappointing that Linda Hamilton is rendered useless for the whole ending. This film released six months before Terminator, so they didn't know what they had, but I'd much rather watch her go all action Jackson instead of Peter Horton here's a who. Still, at least she gets to bitch slap this runt. <coughs> Linda reportedly hated this whole section. I believe it, look at her face. My expression was pretty similar as it's followed with maybe the limpest example of an on-screen the end, but hey, at least it's bloody over. Only 504 sequels to sit through now. I used to really have a disdain for this film, but now that I'm older and have more experience with both children and corn, I appreciate it more. I prefer the short story's ending, but there is a campy charm that can be taken from this action oriented edition. The effects haven't aged all too well, mind you. Poor Isaac, getting swallowed by early season South Park lava. You know, maybe it was very wise that the short film stayed well away from depicting this whole concept. I should speak about the villains, actually. Isaac and Malachi are both great. The uncanny result of casting a 24-year-old to convincingly play a deranged child adds a ton of uneasiness to the character. When he rants about sinners and points right down the camera, I did actually startle. Whew. And Malachi, well, he's just unhinged and actually quite threatening at times. Courtney Gaines got the job because he took a casting assistant hostage with a prop knife. There's a real tingling of danger with this boy. Also, it's not often that you feel fear and hair envy from the same person. It was also a curious choice to create a power dynamic between the two figures. It strips away from their scariness, but it does beef up their roles and keeps the film moving when Bert and Vicky are not around. Overall, honestly, I think these two are the reason the film has been preserved in the memories of horror fans. There isn't too much to say about the film really. It's a standard King adaptation, in a time period that was drowning in standard King adaptations. The budgetary restraints imposed by the author took it down a notch, I think. Hearing the plans of harder violence, with more scenes involving the kids taking on the minister 
and the blue man upsets my horror hound side. I'm also sad that I had to scrap the idea that all the corn turned black and rotted after the villain's defeat. That would have been a swish visual to end on, instead of the car thump and guess we should get going now, whatever, shuffle. The changes make the story more and triumphant, which, as King implied, removes much of the horror. It's certainly not as shocking and visceral as similar material, like who can kill a child? But as it is, this movie fits the Reagan era it was born from. Good old American hero saves the girl and the farm. Bewildering as it is, in terms of the number of sequels and whatnot, Children of the Corn became by far the biggest cinematic property related to Stephen King. We're used to horror sequels wrongly using the word final in their titles. Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Freddy's Dead, the final nightmare. But those were the fourth and sixth entries respectively. Children of the Corn 2 was subtitled The Final Sacrifice. Children of the Corn 2. 2. When only the second film is billed as the ending, and the sequels kept coming like a never-ending cornrow, the franchise feels even more exhausting. But if nine films in the main series is not enough for you, then I have good news. People couldn't keep well enough away, and wanted to give the original tale a second feature-length shot. Have you ever wondered what Stephen King's script for the 1984 film might have been like? Had it ever made it to the screen? Well, wonder no more. Kind of. One of the producers of that previous film, Donald P. Borchers, returned to create a new Children of the Corn remake in 2009. His career since the 1984 film has been intriguing. Would you trust a man whose credits include films called Jailbait and Meat Bulls 4? Anyway, as the sands of time slipped through Donald's fingers, he gradually came to regret how the older film deviated from the source material. This time, he would right his perceived wrongs, assuming full control as producer, writer and director to ensure he could accurately adapt King's vision. A bold mission statement, and one I can fully get behind. But then, he who walks behind the rose sends a couple of discouraging clouds our way. It was not a theatrical film, but a TV movie. It was initially released on the Sci-Fi Channel. And look at this so-called tent during the title screen. Despite the mandate of sticking to King, we are free for free on the prequel opening. It is less revealing this time. No massacring of adults anywhere. Just a bit of Isaac gospeling about. He has not evolved into Isaac the Preacher yet. He's still Isaac the Cowboy. Very cute. The kids of the corn act weirdly as usual, but there's always that one kid that takes things way too far. Praise the Lord! Praise God! Bloody awkward. Hey, look, it's Bert and Vicky. Let's go over and say hi. Oh, oh God, no, no, they're fighting again. Abort, abort! Yeah, remember how King's draft apparently began with 35 pages of non stop arguments between the couple? Porchers evidently went further and made it. 65 pages of endless bickering. Like the short story, this is a couple literally at breaking point. All it would take to push them over the edge would be a dying kid in the middle of the road. Oh wow, speak of the devil when he shall- <laughs> Oof, that hit and run was crunchier this time. The body's stickier too. Nice. But Borchers still can't resist slipping in that Voorhees in the bush shot. I'm starting to get paranoid about every shrub in my own garden, Borchers, please. While you're at it, give us something new and shiny to talk about. Ah! Shit, alright, what the fuck was that? I take it back. The plot carries on down that same dusty road, as you might expect. The couple rage at each other with various degrees of savagery, ranging from snide remarks to full-on slaps to the chops. <laughs> Vicky is especially grating after a short while. Now, this is a period piece, moving back to the story's original 70s setting, with Bert being a Vietnam veteran. Vicky continuously uses his service record as a weapon herself, which comes across in very poor taste, more so as Bert's trauma is revealed to us later. Huh? Huh? Otherwise, she's fine with having a dead kid in the trunk, but under no circumstances will she have a piece of corn in her car. Just throw it out! Will you do that for me? Just throw it out, I don't want it in the car. 
they somehow manage to reach Gatlin without strangling each other to death, and they do the rounds. Bert checks out an admittedly cool church set and uncovers the secrets, while Vicky sulks in the vehicle. What a surprise, the kids circle in and attack once again. There are two highlights of this scene that the 1984 film was lacking. Firstly, forget nails on a chalkboard, now the phrase should be pitchfork on a 1966 board thunderbird. And secondly, uh, just watch this. Zero press, brother! <laughs> Bert gets in on the action, but this time he's less the American everyman hero like Peter Horton. He'll do something cool every now and then, like this snap, crackle, and pop, but then he'll say something lame as fuck. Why don't you put that in your garden and smoke it? Put that in your god and smoke it? What? What? Dialogue as cringy as that deserves a CGI knife throw. Yeah. He tries to escape, but he's not very good at it. To be fair, evading danger is tough when you can only turn at a right angle. True to King, Bert skirts through the corn. Great stuff in the book, less so here. Mainly it just seems to go on forever, much like the corn. It is difficult to make horror scary in the daylight, but this really is drained of all tension. It doesn't help that some of the children wander through like malfunctioning droids. Others are simply more adept at a truffle shuffle than hunting. And come on, answer me this. How could this child ever possibly be scary? I saw his shadow, I saw it. He who walks behind the road. I was back there, walking up the road, looking for the cinema more of his footprints. Only I didn't see any footprints because the ground was all hard and powdery. Around this point, Borges adds two new elements to the story. The first is pretty good. Harkening back to Bert's time in the military, the stress of the situation transports him right back to the jungles of Vietnam. For the remainder of the film, he steadily becomes unstable, which is a lot more interesting to watch than the previous Bert's. But the other thing that Borges inexplicably decided to add was the most uncomfortable sex scene this side of Howard the Duck. Isaac orders two of the teens to get down and dirty, right in front of the whole crowd of children. Fucking hell, look at this little guy. No, oh, no, it's children of the porn. Let me out, let me out. Gentle reminder that Donald P. Borchers wrote a film called Jailbait. Thankfully, we return to Bert, and just like him, we're in desperate need of a long fucking shower or two. Stephen King's depressing climax springs to life. Bert discovers his wife struck up like a crucified corn Jesus, eyes replaced with husky planty madness. What's hilarious is, every other film in existence would be about the husband rescuing the wife, or at least being completely torn up about their failure to do so. Here, Bert doesn't give a single fuck. His PTSD vision zombifies her, but that's about it. It's not so bad. It's bliss. The kids failed to kill Bert, so it's now up to he who walks behind the rose to finish the job in the most anticlimactic ending of the 2000s. We did the same shit in our backyard on a zero dollar budget. The kids are then punished, and the age of sacrifice is amended from 19 to 18, as in the book. The end. Except it isn't. A totally unnecessary post credit scene shows the sacrifice being played out, repeating the notes that the ending scene already covered. Could it be a setup for a new sequel? Involving the barely established character Roof? Fuck knows. Either way, you can rest easy in the knowledge that this 2009 film stands well and truly alone. No sequels. Nothing. Shall we truly get down to the good, the bad, and the ugly of this remake? Well, it's easier to start with the ugly. Just look at it. The whole movie has been smeared in farm dirt. Okay, what about the good? I do appreciate the attempt to make a more serious film that retains more of King's writing. David Anders is alright as Bert, and as I said, I like the PTSD angle, brief as it is. Unfortunately, that's really about it. So the record goes, casting began a mere two weeks before they made the film. It shows. Borchers wanted to cast actual children across the board this time. In theory, this could be scarier in a relatable sense. Isaac from 1984 does not look like your typical child, the one you pass by on the street, the one sitting on your floor right now. 
that these kids do, and they'd kill you for a tin of, you guessed it, corn. The final effect is the exact opposite of scary. I already showed you the adorable nature of some of the kids. I couldn't catch my breath. But what of the two main baddies, Isaac and Malachi? Isaac never really evolved into Isaac the Preacher. Something went wrong with the genetics, and he instead evolved into Isaac the Pilot of the Millennium Falcon. I mean him no ill will, but the old timey Bible speak is too much for the little one. I'm not seeing a deceivingly powerful child, through whom a monstrous evil is communicating. I'm just seeing a boy, trying to remember his difficult dialogue. The Lord loveth a cheerful heart and a glad countenance. The outlander broke our knives, we broke our covenant with God, when you spilled Ahaz's blood in the core. But it... For what other reason has he allowed us to survive unseen and unknown all these years while the world outside grows more wicked? Malachi fares a little better, but he still can't compare to his 1984 counterpart. He's got the look of a mini Carl from Die Hard, but the unhinged nature is lost. And to my surprise, it seems that losing the two characters' power play does lessen them on a feature length scale. This remake was torn asunder by critics and audiences. They did not enjoy the barrage of bickering and the lack of payoff in the end. I usually hate unlikable characters, but I'm a little more lenient in this case, given the source material. Some lines are lifted straight from King, which is fun to see. Sometimes I wonder how I ended up married to you. By saying two little words. But yes, it does wear on you after a while. Of course it does. But I fully agree on the ending. Showing less can often be more effective in horror, but this film shows less than less, and after such a lead up too. My final statement on this film is that I really wanted to like it, but it sadly misses the mark. Oh, silly you. Did you really think Donald P. Borchers was done with you and the children of the corn? Ha, ah, think again. Children of the Corn 2020 left that same road in Nebraska behind, going off in a new direction. The filmmakers must have noted the five minute prequel carnage that kickstarted each previous adaptation, and thought, fuck it! Let's ditch Bert and Vicky and all their baggage, and expand that prequel idea into a feature length story itself. Interesting, but did their gamble pay off? Before we start, Let's have a quick look at the director, and his track record with remakes. <laughs> the plot now follows a girl called Bo, who lives in Ralston, Nebraska. Presumably Gatlin was busy being fumigated or something. The crops are dying, and country life is weighing the poor lass down. Ever notice how the words maze and maze are the same? Amazing. Oi, I know you're hurting, but there's no need to steal my puns, you little shit. Bo watches in shock as another girl, Eden, leads an uprising against the adults, all in the name of a magical corn monster. Their revolution is fleshed out from the usual tale of kids just turning evil against a normal town. Now it is twisted into a revenge drama. <laughs> Little kids! <laughs> the adults of the town keep selling their souls to the government, boo, and to Big Farmer, boo. Consequently, the town is dead, along with a load of kids, and now the older folk vote to remove the corn entirely. Eden demands justice for her deceased kin, and all of their shattered futures. As someone who's been completely fucked over by previous generations, I can relate. Good for you, Eden. I can't, however, relate to her secret allegiance to a corn god. Over a merciful 90 minutes, the children grow more aggressive and powerful while Bo struggles to do nothing about anything. But for me, it's all about the third act. Eden takes a step back, allowing the true villain of the piece to emerge. This film raises two middle fingers to the previous films. Yeah, yeah you punks were too chicken shit to show he who walks behind the rose. Get a load of this leafy Adonis. This film has shortened his name to just he who walks, Presumably because he now literally walks about, and not just behind the rose too. I don't like that name though. How about Edward Cornhands? No, that's fucking dumb. You know what? I'm just gonna call him Cornwallis. 
My brain knows it's stupid. I'm Groot. And the baddie is more disturbing when he's a shapeless manipulator of the corn. My heart, however, my heart loves corn waters. I was mostly checked out by this point already, and I confess, his goofy grass antics woke me up again. Bo's not as big a fan of corn waters as I am. She cracks corn, and she don't care. As if a hit and run against a thousand little cobs wasn't enough, she foils the big bad plan by sending computer generated splinters into the night sky. Mind the fire plugins, Corn Wallace. You're too young to become a husk. It's okay in the end because, like Star Wars, no one's ever really gone. Before I start my actual review of this final film, I should preface with the fact but COVID did stick a spanner in their tractor. Production started in early March 2020. Bad bloody luck for the crew, I do feel for them, but they managed to push through, finally wrapping in June. The film made a festival appearance in October of that same year, and remained unseen until now. It wasn't really worth the wait. It is a decidedly average film, not good, not terribly bad either. It's the best looking of the four films, and features a much higher body count, with more gore than before. But if we boil it down, the story isn't interesting to me. I've said it enough times already through this video, but the subtle mysteries of the short story are what I love about King's version. Focusing on what happened prior strips that all away, aside from some cutaways to creepy corn. At least the acting is a big improvement over the 2009 film, They've gone down the normalish kid route again, but this time, it feels like they cast actual young actors, and not just some random kids that happen to be in the area. Kate Moyer is pretty good as Eden, essentially a gender-swapped Isaac. She receives a much higher screen time than the previous Isaac figures, but how the hell can she compete against the image of primal fear that is Corn Wallace? Oh, Mad Max legend Bruce Spence is there too, which is nice. Oh no, there he goes. The real problem is the movie kind of just trudges along at a predictable pace. As you're watching, you're not worrying about Bo, you're worried about how many hundreds of children of the corn films will exist by the time humanity finally conks it. After all, no franchise ever really dies in the corn. Or something like that. Uh, let's just have some verdicts already. Best protagonist. I have no strong feelings anywhere here. I think I'll give it to 1984, on account of Peter Horton's crop busting and Linda Hamilton's preaching. Amen. Peanut butter and black oh. bread. Best, 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 villains. best, 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 best. With sincere apologies to Corn Wallace, 84 wins again. Isaac and Malachi are low key icons of 80s horror. Best, best, best overall. Over, 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 over. The 2020 film takes this one pretty easily. Good mix of kills and enough bloody goodness to keep your eyes peeled a little while longer. Best, 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 kill, best, kill, best kill, 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 kill. It certainly isn't Bert frolicking in the dirt. Well, what about this then? Simple as mud, but pretty effective. Batter up. Best, best, best kill, 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 kill. Eh, 1984, I guess. What are your thoughts on these four adaptations, and indeed, on all of the Children's of the Corns? Let me know in the comments below. Stay spooky, friends of Corn Wallace.